Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about yet another shady company. This one, American Apparel. Now, American Apparel has a little bit of everything, some horrible ads, sexual harassment, so advanced trigger warning for that, you name it, and they've probably been involved in some sort of scandal surrounding it, essentially. But before we get into there, we are going to start, as always, at the beginning with their company history. So let's get into it. Now, right off the bat, uh, the store is called American Apparel, but it was founded by a Canadian by the name of Dob Charney in 1989 when he was just 20 years old. While originally founded with the humble intention of providing blank garments to screen printers and boutique labels, the brand quickly outgrew its wholesale roots and found a place within the wider retail landscape. The entire industry from streetwear and high fashion labels to big box stores was quick to notice the young brand, full of sass, attitude, and seemingly unstoppable in its growth. Dov Charney was originally set to attend Tufts University in Massachusetts, but in 1990, with a $10,000 loan from his father, he moved to South Carolina and began manufacturing t-shirts. Now, initially there were some struggles. As one source puts it, perfecting the art of production is tough and the manufacturing learning curve can be unforgiving. The company relocated in 1997 to Los Angeles. There, Charney really began to find his market and by the year 2000, American Apparel moved into an 800,000 square foot warehouse. In 2005, the company made Inc's top 500 fastest growing companies ranked 308th. And in the same year, the company made over $200 million. One old Inc article from this time period portrayed Dov Charney as a tastemaker, ladies man, pied piper, bon vivant. He sounds like a charming, fun-loving guy that's on top of the world in this paper, reaching massive heights incredibly quickly. It says, Charney is tinkering with his seven New York retail stores, laying the groundwork for up to 10 more. This is but a part of a bold plan to open the 100th store worldwide by next summer. There are currently 57 American apparel stores, 29 of them in the United States, and an even bolder plan to have 1,000 shops by 2008. All this from a company that had not one retail store as recently as October, 2003. We're not going anywhere, Charney says. It takes him just four months to open his stores, plain white boxes that the meticulously managed American apparel image machine calls community centers. A big smile pushes those herstal cheeks up under one of the many sets of giant aviator sunglasses that almost always adorn his face. At the largest apparel manufacturing facility left in America, some 2,000 factory workers pick from 2 million pounds of fabric stored on site, then cut, sew, and finish garments. Posters, billboards, advertisements, they're all conceived and produced in the factory too, and soon a dye shop will be added. Charney once pushed an image of AA as socially conscious and sweatshop free, but today he says the story is vertical integration. While other companies have fled America to save money, he's making a killing by staying put. And this doesn't really age well, but we'll get there soon. On the surface, this was an American influential and reasonably priced brand. It was trendy, quality, and Charney was on top of the world. And hey, I'm obviously all for ethical sourcing. That's awesome. However, behind this picture perfect image, cracks were already starting to show and the first lawsuit emerged the same year in 2005. While Inc. was calling Dov Charney a ladies' man, Charney was sexually harassing women at his office. Yeah, some ladies' man right there. And this wasn't just a few off-color comments here or there or one brief instance. I'm not saying that it would be completely excusable, but when I say he was harassing women, I mean it was intense at that office to the point where several women said they didn't even feel safe at work. A New York Times article at the time read, sex is used for more than selling clothes at American Apparel. In two separate sexual harassment lawsuits, three plaintiffs who worked on American Apparel's administrative and sales staffs charged they endured sexual misconduct and innuendo and an environment in which women did not feel safe. The culprit, they say, is Mr. Charney, 36. Among the allegations, using crude language and gestures, conducting job interviews in his underwear, ordering the hiring of women in whom he had a sexual interest and giving one of the plaintiffs a vibrator. 
In court papers, Mr. Charney denied all the allegations. And in an emailed statement, he said, "'In my opinion, their lawsuits are a false attempt to extort money from my company and exploit my transparent persona.'" His lawyer, Andrew B. Kaplan said, "'Mr. Charney will vigorously defend these lawsuits "'and that the evidence will show "'that no sexual harassment occurred.'" What they're trying to do, Mr. Kaplan said of the plaintiffs, is use Mr. Charney's openness about his sexuality as a weapon against him. So, you know, exposing yourself to someone or conducting an interview in underwear is not exactly what I would call being open about sexuality. That's rubbing it in someone's face and forcing it onto someone. That's got to be one of the stupidest offenses I've ever heard. One customer service manager even said it's fine if Mr. Charney is seen in his underwear because we're a manufacturer, we make underwear. But yeah, last time I checked, underwear goes under clothing. It is not the clothing. Again, this reason is laughable. I don't give a shit about cursing, clearly, and some crude language isn't all that crude in my book. But by the sounds of things, this wasn't a swear or two, but frequent disturbing behavior. And the attitudes of these people, even among women in his field, blows my mind. The litigation director of the Asian Pacific American Legal Center of Southern California at the time, Julie Su, said that if the sexual harassment allegations were true, he should be held accountable. But then she adds, it's a shame because it would take away from the positive he's done. You know what, Julie? Yes, yes, it would be a shame, but he did do it. So shameful as it is, let the truth be known. Another plaintiff, Rebecca Breinger, who coordinated trade shows and worked in customer service between December 2002 and last January, charges that Mr. Charney exposed himself in the nude in front of her. The third woman, Mary Nelson, 33, a sales manager from November 2003 to January, said in her lawsuit that he invited her to masturbate with him. Miss Pithy and Miss Brinegar, who filed a joint lawsuit and are represented by Gloria Allred, the well-known women's rights lawyer, said they quit their jobs. Miss Nelson, who is represented by Keith A. Fink, said she was fired after Mr. Charney learned she intended to see a lawyer. Unfortunately enough, nothing really happened to Charney here. Many describe Charney as obsessed with sex, while Charney just described his company as unconventional. One was dismissed and two were settled, but Charney continued to grow American apparel, only to get it into far more trouble later on. But we will get there. After all, he didn't face any real consequences, so who would expect that he'd stop of his own volition? But before we get back into Charney and what he's been up to, we're going to talk about more of this supposed sex-obsessed company and the issue they've had with their advertising. Now, American Apparel themselves and their advertisements are a controversial issue all on its own. I've seen some horrible ads in my time, and yeah, I sound really old saying that, but American Apparel ones are particularly cringeworthy. And that's what they do at their best. Esquire shows how their ads have gone from questionable to downright upsetting over time. In the late 90s, they showed young women in tank tops. Nothing wrong with that. But in 2000 and 2001, they were showing more skin. Nothing major, but these are pretty young women, keep in mind. Like one ad from 2005, looks like that one's straight out of a porno, as well as one in 2006. And I just don't understand because in the 2006 one in particular, the underwear is barely visible and it looks like that it's being grabbed off of that model. It's very unsettling. They even claim that for a while, American Apparel was using porn stars in their ads, which, you know, sure, that's fine. They're beautiful people. But, you know, if you're gearing your clothing line towards minors, as you say at the time, then why would you make that connection? Like, seriously, in 2009, they had an ad like campaign for socks and the model, it's, it's very risque and she also looks very young. And even though she was over the age of 18, that ad was banned in the UK because of how she looked, because she was presented as a young, potentially under 18 year old model who was in these risque poses. And in 2012, the now open ad, you would just think it's something for a lingerie store. And it's again, just very revealing, very risque, especially for the times. It was just not fitting of something that's supposed to be for teenagers. And again, perhaps I'm just projecting my own levels of discomfort here, but even in the model's face, they don't look entirely happy. Like, and that's the final ad that got cut and put out there. 
I think the point that I want to make more than anything is that their advertising wasn't just a little bit of a scandal, just to like, you know, name drop the brand a little bit and get attention. It was tacky and it was gross. One 2014 article from The Independent went off on their back to school campaign and said this, it was labeled as pornographic for showing a schoolgirl in a mini skirt leaning over to show her crotch and underwear. It was quickly banned by the Advertising Standards Authority for sexualizing schoolgirls. Earlier this year, the brand caused a stir when an advertisement featured a topless model with the words made in Bangladesh across her pixelated bare chest. They weren't referring to the jeans she was wearing, but instead to the Bangladeshi merchandiser in order to highlight the company's fair labor practices. In 2012, American Apparel had an ad banned for sexualizing minors. It featured a teen girl wearing nothing but white tights. Of course, there's plenty of other advertisements that there's been issues with, and even some miraculously that no one has had an issue with, but American Apparel has most definitely labeled themselves as sexy and yet at the same time marketed towards minors, which that shouldn't, uh, that shouldn't go together. Their ads haven't been just sexy though. Some have been controversial for completely separate reasons. Reuters in 2008 read, Woody Allen on Monday sued American Apparel Inc. claiming the US clothing store used his image in advertising on billboards and the internet without his consent. The billboard ads, which depict Allen dressed as a rabbi, appear in New York and California, according to the suit filed in US District Court in Manhattan. Allen, an Oscar-winning US director known for his work in films such as Annie Hall and Crimes and Misdemeanors, said in the suit that he was neither contacted by the company nor compensated for the use of his image. Allen does not engage in the commercial endorsement of products or services in the United States, according to the lawsuit. He is seeking damages in excess of $10 million, according to the suit. So American Apparel either uses women in their pornographic poses or older men without their consent, with a rare exception here or there. What a weird marketing strategy. Woody Allen later settled for $5 million, by the way, Uh, just a drop in the bucket for them. They obviously didn't rethink much in the following years because Charney argued the billboards were meant to inspire dialogue. He also said, I have already apologized to Mr. Allen and have tried through his lawyers to explain to him the meaning behind the billboards. Although I am sorry that I am in conflict with Mr. Allen, I believe I had the right to express myself in the manner in which I did. And I just love how one sentence goes, I already apologized and explained myself. And then in the next he says, but I had every right to use his image without his permission. Like there's no arguing with someone this dense. So let's just keep it moving. A couple of other things American Apparel also had issues with around 2007 into the early 2010s were dealing with immigration laws and accusations of racism. Now, at the time, both of these were considered relatively minor issues. So we'll just touch on them briefly. For the immigration issue, Charney, as well as American Apparel in general, has always been extremely supportive of immigrants that come to the US to work. They are paid $13 an hour, $5 more than California's minimum at that time, had free English classes, closed the factory during pro-immigrant marches. It's not hard to see why with Charney being an immigrant from Canada himself. I've got no issue with this whatsoever. I think it's great actually. The controversy only really came into play when in July, 2009, American Apparel was investigated. According to ABC, Homeland Security revealed a list of 652 businesses nationwide that will receive audits of their workforce. After an audit of American Apparel's app employee records, the Federal Immigration and Customs Enforcement informed the company that documents for about 1,800 current workers, representing about one third of its Los Angeles-based workforce, indicated they either were illegally working in the US or potentially illegal to work. The workers were given 30 days to 60 days to produce additional documents proving their eligibility. Of the 1,800 workers identified, 1,600 were deemed to be unauthorized to work. The agency wasn't able to verify the status of 200 others. The company previously said it was not found to have willingly hired illegal workers. American Apparel has touted its sweatshop free operation and said it pays some of the highest wages in the industry. This is of course, not at all their biggest controversy. I wanted to give them credit where credit is due and say it's fantastic that American Apparel did this for these immigrant workers. It's a shame what happened. To some extent, I agree with Mayor Antonia Villagrosa at the time who said the government should focus on employers that exploit their workers as opposed to a company that was actually paying its workers well. 
But at the same time, because many others said that their addiction to illegal labor was problematic, I wanted to present both sides of the story here. The thing is, I think what disappoints me the most about this company too, is that they could do so much good. I mean, they are genuinely greener than plenty of other companies we've come across, even if their environmentally friendly claims have been a bit exaggerated too. One source says, Amp Apps has found a way to totally recycle leftover scrap material by using it to, logically enough, create a line of thongs and other skimpy but wearable pieces. That saves over 30,000 pounds of cotton per week and hours of embarrassment caused by unslightly panty lines. They've also launched an all organic sustainable edition line, which features their most popular pieces in 100% organic cotton. Soon about 80% of all cotton we use will be organic, says community outreach director, Sean Shashani. That means 30,000 pounds of cleaner cotton brought that's made and locally harvested and many, many track jackets made guilt-free. The brand's organic and recycled apparel is manufactured entirely in a downtown LA factory where operations are partially powered by solar panels on the roof. Solar energy accounts for a hefty 30% of power used to make AA goods, not least among them, the back in vogue every 20 years, lame leggings and matching headband. Remember that for the next time you decide to show off your fashion foresight. On the other hand, good on you, Eco States, American Apparel's environment rating is not good enough. It uses global organic textile standards certified organic cotton in its organic range, but this only makes up a small percentage of its products. It reuses offcuts created during the manufacturing process, but doesn't have adequate policies on energy use and carbon emissions. It also doesn't use any widely accepted tools to guide measurement and reporting, and there is no evidence it is taking adequate steps to minimize or eliminate hazardous chemicals in its supply chain. What's more, there is no evidence it has adequate policies or initiatives on water usage and wastewater management. For all of these reasons, we couldn't give American Apparel a higher rating, and some real work needs to be done in this area if they are looking to improve. Whether or not they're good enough is ultimately up to the consumer anyway, but it's most certainly a start, so I'll admit that much. They've made an effort, which is something a lot of these companies that I do look into don't even try. However, whether you think they're fantastic for the way they treat their immigrant workers and how they make an effort to be green, or you think they're wrong for hiring illegal immigrants and exaggerating environmentally friendly claims, there's also been claims of racist behaviors that we can't ignore either. In October, 2013, American Apparel was criticized for a culturally insensitive display in one of their Manhattan locations. One article from Ebony read, at a time when nearly every aspect of black life and culture can be bought, repackaged, gentrified, and resold to the highest bidder, it is still both shocking and appalling to see a makeshift voodoo altar adorning the window of a Manhattan American Apparel location. Recently, my friend Rosella Molina, a Yoruba initiate, saw that a larger than life veve for Papa Legba, a spirit respected as the keeper of the crossroads and found throughout the Americas. And three mannequins dressed in a hodgepodge of apparel designed by social media icon artist Kesh mixed together with an assortment of pieces from traditional attire that may be found at a voodoo ceremony. Once Rosella's mobile photo was posted on Facebook, dozens of enraged people representing various African spiritual traditions began calling the store to demand the display be taken down immediately. Immediately. When one African spiritual practitioner asked what was the meaning behind the new display, an American apparel employee told it was the celebration of Halloween. Now, this isn't the first time that American apparel has engaged in problematic practices concerning the treatment of other people's cultures, nor are they the only company to profit off the misappropriated cultural dress during Halloween. It baffles me as to why a store would make the decision to misappropriate a sacred spiritual system that is as old as time in Africa itself. The article goes into more detail about how voodoo has been misrepresented as well, but I decided to dig a bit deeper into these other problematic practices. And as it turns out, American Apparel made the top 10 list from Business Insider, top 10 most racist ads of the modern era. It reads, American Apparel got accused of promoting a new accessory, Mexicans. Comedian Fahim Anwar tweeted a link to an ad showing an American Apparel model holding onto a Hispanic farmer, which was picked up by Gawker. The image, which has since been pulled, inspired the undocumented apparel series from California artist Julio Salgado, 
It seems odd given how much the company has done for the Latino community. Raul is a family friend and the photos turned out great. So we developed them into an ad and put it on our website. The whole controversy seems a bit contrived, a company spokeswoman told the Bay Citizen. Now, it is a bit strange looking and it could be in part because both subjects look so incredibly uncomfortable, but I just have to wonder why they couldn't be a bit more self-aware when this is far from the first, second or third time that I found articles like this. I mean, Who names an entire clothing collection Africa? Just Africa spelled with a K in it. One review on Glassdoor from an employee there even stated that there's racism and xenophobia from upper management. So take that as you will. Now, before we return to upper management and taking a look at our charming CEO, Charney, let's just take a moment to thank today's sponsors. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at just $95, including prescription lenses. Sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses are also available, which the blue light lenses, by the way, amazing. And it's really easy to use Warby Parker. All you do is take a quick quiz. It talks about like, you know, how wide your face is, what type of frames you like, what type of colors you'd like your frames to be. And then it shows you a bunch of results based on what they have and you pick five of them and it's your home try on kit. And then you get them at your home for free. It's really easy. I got to choose everything I like from start to finish and the box got delivered to me very quickly. The glasses were presented very nicely and it was super easy. I got to try them on. They had little test lenses in them, you know, not like prescription or anything, but just clear lenses. Then I got to try them on, take a look in the mirror, see how I liked myself for a couple days. Did I like this? Did I not like this? And then that was it. I sent back the ones that I didn't want and kept the ones that I did want. So if you want to try Warby Parker's free home try on program, ordering five pairs of sunglasses to try on at home for free for five days and there's no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash casket. Again, go to warbyparker.com slash casket. And now we return to the not so charming CEO of American Apparel himself. Let's continue on with his lawsuits because it, it's not gonna get much better. Now, his next lawsuit, again, regarding sexual harassment was reported on by ABC on March 9th, 2011. And again, another trigger warning here because this one is far more graphic than the first two with the three women that we mentioned earlier. American Apparel and its often sued CEO, Dov Charney, have been hit with a $250 million suit by a teenage employee who claims Charney turned her into his sex slave, but the company is firing back and calling the young woman's suit extortion. Irene Morales, 20, claimed that for eight months, CEO Dov Charney forced the former sales clerk into sex, sodomizing her just days after her 18th birthday and keeping her a sex prisoner for hours in his New York City apartment. In a lawsuit filed Tuesday in New York, Morales, who began working for the clothing chain in 2007 when she was just 17, claims Charney demanded Morales to send him sexually explicit photographs of herself and told the high school student that he wanted to have sex with her as soon as she turned 18. The suit alleges that soon after Morales' 18th birthday, Charney demanded she come to his apartment where he appeared at the door wearing only underpants. He forced her to get down on her knees just inside the front door and perform a sex act upon him. Then he dragged her into his bedroom, threw her on the bed, got on top of her and forced her to perform another sex act, according to the suit. Morales claims in her lawsuit, she was then held prisoner in the apartment for several hours and forced to perform additional sexual acts upon defendant Charney. The harassment, Morales says, was not contained to Charney's home. At work, the boss gave Morales a sex toy and it was witnessed by fellow employees. The woman's lawyer says the harassment continued for eight months in which she was forced to perform many more sex acts upon defendant Charney with the clear understanding that failure to do so would result in the loss of her employment and failure to obtain advancement. The woman claims the constant harassment drove her to the verge of a nervous breakdown and she had to quit. Morales never went to police to report the allegations, which if true, would be tantamount to sexual harassment, rape, and false imprisonment. In a statement, American Apparel did not deny any of the allegations, but raised concerns about Morales' motives and timing and accused the woman of attempting to extort the company. 
According to American Apparel's lawyer, Morales left the company without complaint and resigned with a letter of gratitude regarding her positive experience at the company. The company said they believed she was part of some conspiracy to steal money from the company, which I mean, if she was, this would be an extremely specific way to do so. I'm far more inclined to believe Morales, especially considering what we've heard about Charney already. He denied everything obviously as he has before, but this time the company wasn't having it. The company discovered voluminous evidence of Mr. Charney's sexual liaisons with employees and models, the company's court papers said, adding that at least one of these numerous encounters took place at his office. Company investigators also discovered Charney had kept videos of these sex acts on a company server, the paper said. The company said he also sent employees emails with pornographic videos and photos and accused him of using ethnic slurs against certain employees. Charney was suspended, of course. American Apparel finally came to their senses, or at least some of the executives did, and realized that he wasn't a good look for them anymore. Especially with the sexual harassment lawsuits against him and the misuse of company funds and violation of company policy. So how did Charney react? Well, in typical rich boy throwing a temper tantrum, he fucking sued them. The company he founded, American Apparel, Charney sued them for defamation. It seems like this was practically laughed off though because Judge Green said at his hearing that no rational company would hire this guy. It took a bit, but unsurprisingly, Charney lost his case. As for the sexual harassment lawsuit, however, that one thankfully wasn't laughed off so easily. Through September, 2014, the company incurred $8.2 million in insured litigation costs and 1.2 million in uninsured costs. American Apparel even had to get a restraining order against Charney himself that prevented him from badmouthing them, which is just a special kind of impressive. A brand new low for a bitter former CEO. However, in part because of their legal issues, American Apparel started to flounder and then sink. One Business Insider article said, The illegal hirings came back to haunt American Apparel again, this time when a shareholder filed a lawsuit citing fraud. Anthony Andrade was the named plaintiff who alleged American Apparel knowingly hired illegal workers, putting the finances of the company and investors at risk. In addition, the suit claimed American Apparel lied about its financial health to investors who lost a lot of money on paper. So there's certainly that, which also does not look good, but surely their sales could make up for it, right? Well, as another source says, as the hipster fed fashion boom of the 2000s wore off, sales slumped. After reporting a $86 million loss in 2010, AA found themselves in the midst of a federal subpoena with regard to their accounting. And yet another sexual harassment suit aimed at Charney. The compound effect of these issues caused many investors to jump ship, sending the retailer stock plummeting by nearly 70% in the space of a year. Upon announcing that they might have to file for bankruptcy, the wounded manufacturing giant received $14.9 million in funding from a group of Canadian investors that provided a much needed boost to the ailing company. Unfortunately, this proved to be little more than a temporary sticking plaster over a much more serious set of problems. And it wasn't long before the corporate vultures started circling. When Charney lost his CEO position, it was Paula Schneider who replaced him. Yet, despite Schneider's best efforts, American Apparel officially filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the fall of 2015. The deal wiped out all current shareholders, including Charney's stake, once worth 8.2 million, and put the company's creditors in full control. Currently, American Apparel continues to struggle among the glut of fast fashion brands like H&M, Uniqlo, and Zara, companies less tied to a particular aesthetic, but remains committed to keeping manufacturing within the US. To date, the company continues to operate to the best of its ability, although its retail stores are closing their doors right across the globe. And I'd say that's a pretty decent stopping point for today's episode. American Apparel is no longer the icon they used to be, and I'd say to a degree, it's deservedly so. They're not, by any means, one of the worst companies I've ever looked at. We've seen far more lawsuits, controversies, and the like on these, but by the same token, I thought it would be interesting to talk about and just dive a little deeper into this topic and see how much a company can be ruined by a bad CEO. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes. 
And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to click on my Linktree link in my description box. It's going to have links for everything, all of my social media, Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, Discord, like all that good stuff, projects I'm involved in, you name it, it's there. So again, thank you all so much for making it to another episode. I love you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.